Chapter 9, Part 1 of The Seven Stairs by Stuart Brent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9, Bark Point, Part 1. Whenever I travel, one thing is certain, that I will get lost. Perhaps if I could remember which is my right hand and which is my left, or tell north from south, I should be able to follow directions more successfully. But it probably wouldn't help. I have an unfailing knack for choosing the wrong turn and a constitutional incapacity for noticing important signs. It was therefore not surprising that on a summer day twelve years ago, while making my way toward Canada, I turned up Bark Bay Road, thinking I had found a shortcut, and very nearly drove off a cliff overhanging Lake Superior. Berating myself as usual, I looked around and observed a man working in a field not far from the road. He wore a battered felt hat, a shirt open at the neck, heavy black trousers supported by suspenders and strong boots. His eyes were sky-blue, and his weathered skin, brown as a nut, was creased in a myriad wrinkles on the neck and about the eyes. When I approached and asked him how to get to Canada, he replied in an accent that I could not place. His speech was rapid and somewhat harsh in tonality, but his manner was cheerful and friendly, so I paused to chat with him. He said he was preparing his strawberry field for next year. "'This is beautiful country,' I said. "'Yah, it is that,' he said. "'I wish I owned some of it,' I said. "'I think I could live here for the rest of my life.' "'Well, this land belongs to me. I might sell you an acre if you'd like.' As we walked across the field toward the bay, he said, "'Are you a son of Abraham?' I had never been called anything that sounded quite so beautiful. "'Yes, I am a son of Abraham,' I said proudly. "'My name is Wayno, he said. "'I am a fisherman, but I own this land.' Trees, grass, and water. There was nothing else to be seen except a small house covered with flowers and vines a quarter mile across a clover field. "'Who lives there?' I said. "'My brother-in-law, Mike Matson. He might sell you his house,' Wayno said. I met the Matsons. Mike looked kindly. His eyes were gray rather than blue, but his skin was as deeply brown as Wayno's, with as many crinkles about the eyes.' Wayno's sister, Fanny, wore a kerchief about her head, tied with a small knot beneath her chin. She spoke little English, and our business transaction was often interrupted while Mike translated for her in Finnish. I bought the house and an acre of ground. The house had only two small rooms, no running water, no toilet. This didn't matter— like the room that originally housed the seven stairs, I wanted it. I had the identical feeling, no matter what the cost or how great the effort and sacrifice that might be entailed, this place must be mine. My soul stirred with nameless wonder. I felt lifted into the air, my life charged with new purpose and meaning. I put down one hundred dollars as earnest money, arranged a contract for monthly payments, and became a part of Bark Point. Bark Point is located at the northernmost corner of Wisconsin. At this writing, exactly five people live there the year round. In summer, the Brents arrive, and our neighbors, Clay Dana, Victor Marcula, Robert McElroy, Wayno Wilson and Mike Matsons, swelling the total population to as many as fifteen adults and children. The nearest town, Herbster, is six miles away. Farther south is the town of Cornucopia, and to the north, 
port wing. Thirty-five miles off the coast of Lake Superior stand the Apostle Islands, and beyond, Canada. It is about as far from Michigan Avenue as you can get. This new habitat, which I grasped so impulsively, provided a kind of spiritual nourishment which the city did not offer. And later, when I married Hope, she responded as eagerly as I had to the benign sustenance of this isolated sanctuary. It is not only the natural beauty and quiet remoteness of the locale, but also the strength that we find in association with our neighbors, whose simplicity stems not from lack of sophistication, but from the directness of their relations with the forces of life and nature. There is John Roman, who lives in Cornucopia, the tall, thin, master fisherman of the northern world. He is gentle, shy, and rather sensitive, with the courage of one who has been in constant battle against nature, and the wisdom given only to those who have endured the privations and troubles and disappointments of life completely on their own. Now well into his seventies, he fishes a little for pleasure, cuts pulp to make a few dollars, and spends much of his time listening to foreign news reports on his shortwave radio. When he stops by for his glass of tea, he never comes empty-handed. There's always something wrapped in a newspaper to be presented to you in an offhand manner, as though to say, please don't make a fuss about this, just put them in your freezer until you're ready to eat them. The package, of course, contains trout. When no one else can catch trout, John Roman can. He knows every lake and river and brook, and he uses nothing but worms to bait his handmade fishing rod and gear. So far as John is concerned, there isn't a fish swimming that won't take a worm. He has caught trout that weighed fifty pounds, and once he tangled with a sturgeon that wanted to carry him to the bottom of the lake, and could have. The sturgeon encounter occurred about eight miles from our house, on a lake called Sisquit that is filled with walleyes, bass, some smaller panfish, and sturgeon. One morning, while fishing alone in his boat, John thought his hook had caught on a sunken log or rock. He edged the boat forward slowly, dragging the hook, but nothing gave. He moved the boat backward still no give. Finally, John had a feeling that he could reel up. He could, but only very slowly. Then, all at once, the sturgeon came straight up from the water, looked at John, then dove straight down, and the boat began to tip and go down too. John promptly cut the line. He is a regular old man of the sea but he found no point, he said, in trying to land a fish weighing perhaps two hundred pounds. The thing to do when you are outmatched is cut the line. John has met the problems of his own life, but the reports of the world concern him. The danger of fascists appearing in the guise of saviors of democracy worries him. He senses that men are losing their grip on values and are in for a hard time. But what he cannot understand are the reasons for moral apathy. If an ignorant man in the North Woods can see trouble at hand, is it possible, he wonders, that others do not? Bill Roman is one of John's sons and the husband of Wayno's only daughter, Lila. Bill used to run the filling station in Cornucopia. Now he builds houses. But his real genius lies in his understanding of boats and the water. He would advise me, look at the barometer every morning before you go out and believe it. If you're caught in a sudden squall, slow the motor and head for the nearest shore. Don't go against the wind. Stay in the wake of the waves. Don't buck the rollers and don't be proud. 
keep calm, and get into shore no matter where it might be. Bill is known for fabulous skill in getting out of tight squeezes, and his advice is good enough for me. He is also the only man I have known who could properly be described as innocent. His philosophy of life is built upon an utter incapacity to be moved by greed or ambition. Just live, he keeps saying. Just live. Don't fight it. Don't compete. If you don't like what you are doing, change. Don't be afraid to change. Live in harmony with what you are and what you've got. Don't fight your abilities. Use them. I like living, and I like to see others live. Bill tries to get on, so far as possible, without money. And with Bill, that is pretty far. I try to never think about money, he says. When you start thinking about money, you get upset. It hurts you. That's why I like Bark Point, where we can live simply. I got my health, my wife, my boy. I've got my life. I don't believe in success or failure. I believe in life. I build for others and do the best I know how. I listen to music on the radio. I go fishing. Every day I learn something. Books are hard to come by here, but I have reread everything we've got. And I love the winters here better than the summers. In the winter we can see more of our friends and sit and talk. But money is evil. Money and ambition. Money always worries me. I'm glad I'm without it. I have enough without it. What I want, I can have. But the secret is to know what to want. Over the years we built additions to the house until there were enough bedrooms for all of us, a sitting room with a magnificent fireplace, and even a Finnish bathhouse called a sauna. We enjoy taking steam baths and have discovered the children do too. Raspberries and blueberries grow by the carload in our field. There are apples on the trees and Sebago salmon in our lake. This particular salmon is a landlocked fish, generally weighing between five and six pounds and very handsome. His skin is covered with silver crosses. He has a short hooked mouth and his flesh is orange. He is caught by trolling. A few miles from our house are rivers and streams seldom discovered by tourists. Hence, we can catch rainbows weighing four and five pounds, and browns often weighing more. We have lakes where we can catch northerners weighing twenty, thirty, forty pounds, and walleyes by droves. We can take you to a lake where you can catch a fish in one minute. Not very big, but a variety of panfish seldom seen or caught anywhere else. We can take you to a trout stream where you can fish today, come back next week, and find your footprints still in the sand, utterly unmolested. It is a land of beauty and plenty, but nature is not soft. Sometimes a northeaster will blow for five days at a time. Then you can stand at the window and watch the lake turn into something of monumental ferocity, driving all human endeavor from the scene. Trees are uprooted, windows are smashed, telephone wires and power lines are downed. Lightning slashes, the rumble of thunder is cataclysmic, and the rain comes. Often Wayno would call and warn of an impending storm and the necessity of securing the boat with heavy rope. But sometimes it was too late, and we would have to go out in the teeth of the early storm to do battle, rushing down the beach in our heavy boots, heads covered with oilskins, beating against the rising wind whose force took the breath out of you but the roaring surf, the lashing rain, the wind tearing at every step 
are tonic to the blood. One night, while standing at the window, watching the hard rain falling on the bay, I was suddenly alerted to action by the sight of water rushing over the embankment which we had just planted with juniper. The torrent of water washing away the earth was obviously going to carry the young juniper plants along with it. There was only one thing to do, and it had to be done at once. Cut a canal in the path of the onrushing water to channel the flood in a different direction. Hope was napping. I awoke her, and armed with shovels, we pitted ourselves against the storm. At once we were up to our ankles in mud. Hope's boots stuck, and being heavy with child, she was unable to extricate herself. My tugging only made matters worse, and with shouts of anguish we both toppled over into the mud. But no damage was done, and muddy from head to foot, wallowing in a slew of muck, laughing and gesturing and shouting commands at each other, we got on with cutting the canal. It was mean work, but there was something exhilarating about it all, and when the challenge was successfully met and we were in by the fire, quietly drinking hot chocolate, a kind of grave satisfaction in knowing that this was in the nature of things up here and that we had responded to it as we should. Bark Point is a good place for growing children as well as for tired adults. It is good for children to spend some time in a place where a phrase such as know the score is never heard, where nobody is out to win first prize, where nobody is being urged continually to do something and do it better, and where the environment is not a constant assault upon quietness of the spirit. Children as well as adults need to spend periods in a non-communicative and non-competitive atmosphere. I am opposed to all those camps and summer resorts set up to keep the child engaged in a continuous round of play activities, give the body all it wants, and pretend that an inner life doesn't exist. At Bark Point, our children can learn something firsthand about the earth, the sky, the water. They plant and watch things grow, build and watch things form. There is no schedule and no routine, but every day is a busy day filled with natural activities that spring from inward urgings, and the play they engage in is something indigenous to themselves. Before the lamprey eels decimated the lake trout, most of the men in the Bark Point area fished for a living. Years ago, I was told, Bark Point boasted a school, a town hall, a general store, even a post office. But now commercial fishing is almost at an end. The fine Lake Superior trout and whitefish are too scarce. So the bustle of the once thriving fishing village is gone, along with the anxious watch by those on shore when a storm comes up. No need for concern now. Let it blow. No one is fishing. Almost no one. But the few remain, marvelous jolly fellows, rich with earthy humor, strong, dependable, completely individualistic. Every other morning they take their boats far out in the lake and lift the pond nets. It is dangerous work and thrilling, too, when from two to three hundred pounds of whitefish and trout are caught in one haul. Nearly everyone is related, and most of the children have the same blue eyes and straw hair. But the children grow up and discover there is nothing for them to do. Fishing is finished, and about all that is left is to cut pulp in the woods or become a handyman around one of the towns. Farming is difficult. The season is so very short 
and considerable capital is required to go into farming on any large scale. Nobody has this kind of money. Then, too, the old folk were beginning to hear for the first time a new theme. The work is too hard. For a time, this filled them with consternation. But they recognized the sign of the times and even came to accept it. The young people no longer were interested in working fifteen and sixteen hours a day as their fathers had. They left their homes and went to Superior or Duluth or St. Paul or much farther. The few that remained stayed out of sheer bullheadedness or innate wisdom. It was an almost deserted place when I found it, and it has remained so all these years. Those who stayed became my friends, and their world is one I am proud and grateful to have entered. I have played cribbage and horseshoes with them, gone with them on picnics and outings, fished all day and sometimes late at night. We have eaten, played, and worked together, but most important to me has been listening to them talk. Their conversation is direct, searching, and terribly honest. Many of their questions bring pain. They strike so keenly upon the wrongs in our world. I am used to answering complicated questions. Theirs possess the simplicity that comes directly from the heart. Those are the unanswerable questions. I would often sit with them in dead silence around the fire, five or six men dressed in rough clothing, their powerful frames relaxed over a bottle of beer or a glass of tea, each lost in his own thoughts. But this silence wasn't heavy. It was an alive silence. And when someone spoke, it was not to engage in nonsense. Never have I heard commonness or cheapness enter into their conversation. When they talked, what they said had meaning. It told something. A cow was sick. An axle from a car or a truck or a tractor broke. The nets split in two. Soon the herring season will be upon us. What partnerships will be entered into this year? The weather is too dry or too rainy. Someone is building a shed or a house. Someone cut his thigh and needed thirty stitches. Someone needs help in bringing in his hay. End of chapter 9, part 1 Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much.